recording recording is going on so hello everyone welcome to the second day of our webshop on market analysis i trust you have found yesterday's sessions to be interesting stimulating um, as per our agenda well yesterday we had yeah all the all the introductions and all the protocol things but then basically we discussed the um methodologies and methods and sources of information we discussed the product definition which is very important and then we discussed uh, the tray map and then you had the opportunity of working on the exercise for a while how did you find the exercise was it helpful was it useful did it did it help you clarify concepts did it help you uh, sort of consolidate what you had learned i'm, I'm curious yes yeah. it was very helpful okay not, on, not only yes for yesterday but we always uh, use a trade map uh, for our works and uh, for market researching and uh, i always uh, pay attention only the tariffs uh, the last uh, section which country applied uh, custom tariffs uh, for example for azerbaijan of course yeah and um, it's Mm, so helpful thank you thank you well i I'm, I'm happy that it was helpful and it's a good thing that you mentioned tariffs because it gives me a perfect segue into starting the topic of today because today's topic is all about tariffs and defining market access conditions so if that is all right with you let's get into discussing market access conditions okay and therefore let's let's get started we're still defining where to play so yesterday we looked at market size market dynamics we looked at distance we looked at potentially cultural differences and characteristics that make markets attractive that that make things, make markets appealing, right? So now let's see what markets, what market access conditions are like, sorry. So what does market access condition or, or information market access condition do? It's very simple, you'll, you'll know what I mean. It's about evaluating the competitiveness of your production vis-a-vis -vis that of others getting into the market. How much will it cost to get into the market? Uh, and therefore select markets based on where it is more convenient. And one final thing that is very important is it also provides you or provides the, the producers with the right signals on what type of product adaptation is required to ensure that they conform to the market requirements. And this, I'm still talking about tariffs and later we will talk about non-tariff measures and all these things, but I'm still talking about tariffs. So basic recap, what is a tariff? Well, a tariff, we all know that a tariff is a tax, a tax that is levied on the imports by the importing country and therefore paid by the importer because of course the exporter doesn't live in the in the target country so they can't go and pay the tariffs the taxes but the importer doesn't take the money out of their own pocket the importer will almost certainly charge the importer for the cost of the tariff so the, sorry, the exporter. So the exporter will have to pay through a lower price the, the cost of the tariff. And there are different types of tariffs. 
and each type has a different effect. As with all taxes, well, taxes have two objectives. The first objective is obviously to raise money for the state. And this is one of the only mechanisms that the state has to get revenue. So it's an obvious one. But secondly, and this is the most important objective, is to reduce supply of imported products so as to protect domestic supply, right? And how much and how that protection takes place is precisely why different types of tariffs are important, are relevant, because they do make a difference. Let's see. The first type of tariff, the one that is most commonplace, it's everyone knows it's the simplest one. It's called ad valorem. Ad valorem is Latin for ad value. That's very simple. It's a percentage rate that is applied on a product. So in, in Australia, you take wines and you apply the 5% tariff and the expensive French wine vis-a-vis -vis the cheap New Zealand wine. Well, you apply the same tariff and it's very simple. You get the same level of protection and the same level of, of reduction of impact. So it's the same thing, it's completely transparent because Higher the, the higher the value of the imported product will, the higher the tax, and the lower the, the price, the lower the tax. Very, very simple. But there's, there's no, it's very straightforward, there's no mystery with this. But then there are specific tariffs. And specific tariffs make all the difference in the world. Because specific tariffs are not levied on the value of the product, but on some physical attribute, weight, volume, size, packaging units. And they are most frequent in agricultural products. Why? Let me show you why. Take the case, and this, these are all numbers that make sense. I mean, the tariffs are actually real and the, the prices are about about real, or at, at least reasonable. Take beef, and you take the country of Switzerland where I live, and Switzerland has a specific tariff on beef which costs 1,368 Swiss francs per 100 kilos. How does that work? Well, if we have cheap beef coming from, I don't know, France next door, which is because Switzerland is not part of the EU, there are tariffs on beef coming from France, okay? So French beef comes in and French beef is not necessarily fantastic or take Italian beef. It's not known to be great quality. Italian beef will be about $3 a kilo, three Swiss francs a kilo. It's not great. And take Argentine beef, which is really, really top notch quality it's 12 swiss francs a kilo because it's about four times the quality so four times the quality four times the price roughly right it's never a perfect uh, comparison but it's a rough comparison in other words the difference in price reflects a difference in quality that's important but then both of these beef both of these pieces of beef hit the border and they get hit by a 14 Swiss franc specific uh, tariff. Actually not 14, but 13 and 68 cents. Let's do 14 for simplicity's sake. What happens? Well, now the cheap Italian beef is 17 Swiss francs a kilo, whereas the Argentine beef is 26 Swiss francs a kilo. Now the prime beef, the Argentine beef, is not four times the price, but only 1.4 times the price. Both are more expensive, but the cheaper one is proportionally much more expensive than the expensive one. See what I mean? It, the difference, the impact of tariffs is asymmetric. It's not symmetric based on value. 
it actually makes the cheaper things more expensive proportionately. That proportionate effect is what is called the ad valorem equivalent. And as you can see, it can only be calculated by taking into account the actual specific tariff and the actual price of the product to calculate what is the effective impact, right? So the key point is specific tariffs, because they're not levied on value, they do change the relative prices. And by doing that, and, and they do, sorry, they do that by raising the lowest import prices most as a proportion of, of the price, right? So they provide a bigger protection from the lower priced imports. And by doing that, they generate really effective protection for the, for the local production. This is why relative, um, sorry, specific tariffs are uh, highly used in agriculture. Then there are really interesting tariffs, which are combined. So there is a component of being ad valorem and there's a component of being specific, right? Uh, Japan, the, U, the EU, Canada, all of them use this thing where you have one, one specific tariff and then on top of that, a, an ad valorem one. Then th th this is what are compound tariffs. So, so take the case of chocolate in the, in the US and the expensive Swiss lint chocolate which goes approximately for yeah, six thousand dollars a ton will have these two and both of them will be added so it's the 4.3 ad valorem plus the specific and that means that the tariff is 3261 that is a 51 percent increase in the price but if you take the cheap garoto chocolates from Brazil, the fact that they have, that there is a, a specific tariff means that the actual paid tariff is 1,896, so a 60% impact. So having a, a compound tariff sort of reduces the, the asymmetry of the impact, but still generates an asymmetric impact because there is the specific component. Okay. Then, of course, there are the mixed the, the 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 mixed tariffs, which allow you to have a minimum or a maximum. So you apply both tariffs, and whatever comes higher or lower, that's the tariff that is applied. So it, again, it's just a, a a creative management of these things. Then there's variable tariffs which are still not widespread. In, in fact, they don't really exist nowadays, but they are variable on the composition of the products. And these are beginning to be strongly discussed. I don't know if you are, if you have been following the discussions around the COP26 and the reduction of, of CO2 emissions and all these things, there is a big discussion around uh, putting in tariffs that levy the amount of CO2 generated during the production and importation process. That would be a variable tariff because it doesn't depend on the product itself, but on the production process, production and transport process of the product. Okay. Then there are tariff quotas. I don't know if you have ever heard of tariff quotas, but this is an interesting phenomenon. Tariff quotas are tariff schemes that have a two tier system. So you've got a tier from zero to X number of units, kilos, whatever, of a whatever product, and that contingent, that is called a contingent also, that quota pays only a tariff, a given specific tariff, or specific valorem, whatever. 
eight parts. But for any unit of the product imported above that threshold, there is the tariff plus an additional tariff. So for example, bananas from um, entering the EU have a quota system. So bananas, and Colombia produces bananas and exports quite a lot of them. Uh, bananas, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but there's a contingent of, of around 1 million boxes a year. The, that first million boxes pays something like 7 euros per box. But box 1 million one and onwards, they pay the 7 euro per box plus an additional 6 or 7 euros per box, something like that. So it's two specific tariffs, one on top of the other, contingent on a contingent on a limited specific number of products. These are tariff quotas. So basically what I'm saying is there are a variety of uh, tariff schemes. All of them, well, comparing them is very difficult. If you, if I'm comparing, for example, the Swiss 1,368 Swiss franc per kilo tariff on beef and the, um, I don't know, a 25% tariff on beef, which is higher? It's impossible to know because one is levied on the on the volume, on the kilos, the other is levied on the price, on the value. So I can't compare them unless I use these ad valorem equivalents, which are basically understanding what is the effect, the impact of the tariff on the product. And, and they have to be individualized based on the values. So um, all this to say that these are very useful at valorem equivalents are very useful to compare tariffs. Now, tariffs are in themselves a complicated issue, but they get even more complicated when you start putting in into the picture the agreements that reduce those tariffs. And because there are a number of types of agreements, well, the complexity can increase. So there are there are still some, increasingly less, but they still exist. And I have the feeling that they will continue being around for a bit. What are called partial scope agreements. These are agreements between two or more countries where they don't just open up their economies and, and trade between themselves. Either. What they do is they open up a number, a specific number of products. And they can be negotiating in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. What was negotiated was a preference vis-a-vis -vis the, the existing tariff. So it was the existing tariff minus 50%, minus 70%, minus 20%, whatever. Or a contingent of product, a quota of products from one country to another that would be eligible for um, duty-free treatment. There's another, this is the commonplace thing, the free trade agreements, the free trade areas, free trade. Um, they have a, a number of names, FTAs, etc. What they do is they eliminate all tariffs between participating countries. So it's between two, three, four, five, however many. The, this is the most commonplace type of agreement nowadays. Then there are customs unions. Custom unions are an FTA, so a free trade agreement, free trade, no tariffs at all between members, and a shared external tariff, a common external tariff. So all the members of this agreement, like the EU, for example, to, a, to an extent, have free trade within themselves and a common tariff that they share towards third parties. Okay. Then there are common markets. So the EU is actually a common market because it's a customs union 
plus free flow of factors across the region. This is why within the EU, football players from France count as nationals when they play in, in Italy or Spain or Germany, right? Because there is free flow of production factors and labor is one of the production factors. So people can, fl can work, you know, French man can work in Germany or can work in Bulgaria as if they were working in France. Then there is an economic union, which the EU is partially one, because then it's not only shared trade regime, it's also shared economic regime in, of some sort. So the EU, part, parts of the EU share the euro. So they share a common currency. Other, other countries don't share the currency and they're still part of the EU. The Caribbean Common Market, uh, the CARICOM, they have the Eastern Caribbean dollar, but that's not shared by everyone. So these are not incredibly common cases, but they do exist. And the thing is, FTAs proliferate and free trade agreements and all types of schemes proliferate. So this is just to show you that until this was 2019, I haven't updated this in a while, you can see how many trade regimes exist in the EU. So there, there's lots of, of trade regimes, there's lots of agreements, and what that means, it is very difficult to understand what are the actual market access conditions for one product in one market when it comes from another market. Which is why um, which is why it is very important to use a tool. So I know that you have been using trade map as, as, uh, as we were being told a while ago, you have been using trade map for your tariff information. Unfortunately, trade map is not a fantastic tool for market information. Trade map is a fantastic tool for Trade flow information, yes, really good. But when it comes to market access conditions, the best tool is this one, market access map. You can see from my screen, it's called macmap.org. Once you register for any one of the ITC market analysis tools, you're registered for all of them. So it's one password and for all of them. And what this tool does is it provides you with a really powerful tool to access really complete, really large databases. So the easiest use possible is to identify your exporting country, your destination country, your product, and find the tariff that is applied by the destination country to that product coming from the exporting country, and you get the number. So Take Azerbaijan, yeah, with a Z, not with an X. Take a country, Colombia, and take one product. I really like tomatoes, so it's going to be tomatoes. And here it comes. It's very simple. From Azerbaijan to Colombia in 2020, the product tomatoes has MFN duties of 7.5. Do you know what MFN stands for? Who can tell me what MFN stands for? Uh, actually, I don't know exactly, but I think uh, market founding, something like that. I do not know exactly that, but... Okay, MFN stands for Most Favoured Nation. And Most Favoured Nation um, is a really, really, really bad name for what it is. It is a category that was developed 
in the old GATT, the, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs that was created in 1949 at the end of the Second World War and that existed until 1995. And from January 1st, 1995, the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which assumed its functions, now manages what is called the GATT 94, which is the, the legal regime. So within all of this legal regime, the expression most favored nation actually applies to every other member of the WTO. So it's not best friends. It's not preferential rates. It's exactly the opposite. It's the minimum rate that I will apply to anybody without a special regime. So this is the, the, the basic rate for everyone, everyone who is a member of the WTO. Okay. So most favored nation doesn't mean best friends. It means the opposite. It means everybody. So what this says is Azerbaijan and Colombia do not have any type of preferential agreement. Why? Because it's only the MFN, that is the everybody rates that are applied from Colombia to Azerbaijan when it comes to tomatoes. So that this is good and useful if I am trying to understand how much I will pay from Azerbaijan to Colombia. But that's not enough for what we want to do. Because yesterday I said that the real difference is not the actual tariff. Take an example. So we're going to sell peanuts. Uh, what's the other? Uh, ground nuts, they call them in Africa. We're going to sell peanuts in Zambia. Africa. Zambia is a good producer, a very large producer of, of peanuts. And we go and find that the tariffs that are applied to us are actually 50%. Initial reaction would be 50%. That is expensive. No way. I'm not exporting there. But when we compare how much Zambia applies to everybody, we realize actually it applies 50% to everybody. So yeah, tariffs are high, but they are equally high for everybody. So it doesn't make a difference whether they're 20, 50, 100, 7,000, whatever the value of the tariff is, if it's applied to everybody, it's a level playing field. So it's okay. It's not bad. We can compete with other suppliers. Of course, it will be difficult competing with local suppliers. Yes. But when it comes to imports, equal footing. So the value, the specific value of the tariff is meaningless or has limited meaning. What is important, what really helps us in our decision matrix is the tariff advantage or disadvantage? It's understanding if I am competing. So, for example, coming back to our examples of yesterday, um, if we're going to export tomatoes to Russia, because Russia is a really attractive market and we have 85% share of it, what is really interesting is understanding how do we compare to Turkey, our main competitor, in the Russian market, in the Russian market, in terms of the tariffs, do we have zero and they have zero? Fine. Do we have zero and they have ten? Yes, even better. Do we have ten and do they have zero? Mm, not fantastic. Right? It's that comparison that is valuable because that is what takes what tells us what is our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis our competitors' competitiveness. So to do that, to understand that, we need to come to compare. And we can compare markets, competitors, or product. So what I have been doing, what I've been discussing is comparing competitors. What is our competitive situation vis-a-vis -vis other competitors? So if we click on competitors, we identify the exporting country is Azerbaijan. 
Oh, of course, sorry. We have to say all countries. We say the destination country in this case is uh, Russian Federation. Let's keep on talking about tomatoes only because I really like them. Ah, uh, sorry, I've got fat fingers today. So the table that comes out is very interesting. It shows me the MFN tariffs. We've just discussed what MFN is. The effectively applied tariff. And there's a note here that explains that the effectively applied tariffs at the HS6 level is a simple average of the national tariff line rates applied. And there's a calculation of the preference margin. In other words, how much advantage does this country have in its tariff in comparison to the existing MFN tariff? Okay. So we can see that Afghanistan has a really substantive advantage vis-a-vis -vis us in Russia, in tomatoes. Or at least, I don't know if us, but let's see. Azerbaijan, hey, they have no advantage because we also have duty-free access to that market. Well, that's actually quite good because we pay zero and potential competitors, Albania, Algeria, they also export tomatoes, quite a few of them. Well, they have to pay 938%. So we have an advantage of 3.13% difference in our favor. Nice. Let's see now what happens with Turkey. Uh, Turkey is not here. Oh, God, yeah. We also have an advantage vis-a-vis -vis Colombia. Yeah, like Colombia is going to export tomatoes to Russia. So, okay. Turkey, Turkey has, an, has a tariff of 938%. So we do have 9.38% difference vis-a-vis -vis them because we pay zero, they pay 9.38%. So we have almost a 10% value advantage vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Yes, I like that, because now we know that when it comes to Russia, we compete in substantially favorable conditions. We have a tariff advantage in the Russian market vis-a-vis -vis our main competitor, Turkey. Nice, like that. And this same analysis can be applied to every product in every country, but you know, doing this thing of browsing through the entire list, that can be a bit of a of a bummer. That that, that can be a bit of a of a challenge. I mean, it's yeah, it takes time. So maybe we want to see it as a map. This is why it's called market access map. Because it shows us in green the target country, and then in color coding, what are the average tariffs? The darker the blue, the higher the tariff. And then there is this additional bubble on top that says, which are the suppliers? So as we can see, there is very limited surprise in that Azerbaijan is one of the big boys. We have 0% applied, two trade agreements in place, and we have $200 million worth of exports of fresh or chilled tomatoes to Russia. But Belarus, Belarus, they also have a 0% tariff and they have much lower exports 
and Turkey, what about Turkey? They have a higher tariff, 938%. So their exports are only 74,000, 74 million. Right? That is the advantage of this of this app, of this application. It's, it's, it is actually an application. Or you can see also in terms of charts. And here, of course, the chart compares, by definition, the biggest exporters or the, the ones that are closer in the region, the ones that are more relevant. So here we see that Azerbaijan has a 0% applied tariff, whereas Turkey, Morocco, and China, key competitors, also all face 9.38%. Right. So again, it's a comparison that is valuable. Now, if we come back to compare, we can also compare different markets. So it's exactly the same information, but instead of seeing the cube from this face, we turn it and see it from this face. So here we select Azerbaijan. And we choose all destination markets and we go back to our tomatoes and here what we have is a comparison of the same information so the MFN tariff the effective the, 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 what is the standard tariff if you will within the WTO the effectively applied tariff, that is the tariff that in practice is applied, and the preference margin across all the countries in the world for Azerbaijan. Here it is sorted according to alphabetical order, but you can sort it by margin of preference. Right? You can see that the little row, the, the three little lines indicate that now this table is sorted according to preference margin. And we can sort it from the highest to the lowest. So we've got the lowest margin in Uzbekistan where we have to swallow a 40% tariff. So all of these tariffs are fairly expensive. In Switzerland, we face 1.31%. So possibly, I don't know, interesting. In the US, we face 0.52%. So there's actually very few countries that apply tomato tariffs to us. The rest of the world, so you can see that you know the rest of the list has 0%. That's interesting. Wait, no, 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 I'm reading this wrong. I'm reading this wrong. Sorry, 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 sorry. I was looking at the preference margin, not at the effectively applied. Sorry, excuses. So what I'm saying here is in these countries where we face a 0% tariff, but the MFN is, for, is higher, what happens is we have a huge advantage. This is, this is the reality. Because the tariff we pay is zero, but the tariff others pay is this much. Okay? Which means that in the case of Uzbekistan, we pay zero, but probably Turkey, they pay 40%. That means it's, it could be interesting to explore Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or Armenia or Moldova, or all of these countries, well, possibly Georgia is not the easiest country to enter right now, the easiest market to enter right now. But what this is telling us is the advantage is high. And yeah, sorry, Switzerland is going not, not going to be a really attractive market because Azeri tomatoes pay almost 70% tariff. So yeah. Not going to fly, sorry. 
we could also understand this, the same thing. So the point I'm trying to make is this is how we understand what is comparative competitiveness of our products in different countries based on market access conditions. And there's an additional element that has become very important for certain products in the past. Well, in the four years of the Trump administration, they became incredibly important. And those are trade remedies. What are trade remedies? Your anti-dumping duties, your countervailing duties, all those things that try to put in place additional tariffs to specific products from specific countries because, because of a reason, because of whatever reason. So it's very important to understand what are the, ah, sorry, exporting country, Azerbaijan. Uh, let's see if, no, well, it's going to be, the result is going to be nothing, but, ah, sorry, fat fingers today. There's nothing, there's no countervailing, there's no trade remedies, anti-dumping, safeguard, anything applied to entire chapter 07 from Azerbaijan in Russia. So it's fine, we don't have a problem. But in the case of Russia, if we were exporting aluminium plates, then we would be facing one. On the other hand, if we take a look at China, and the exporting country is the US, then we see that the list is quite a bit bigger. So this is all meat, and there are all kinds of um, everything has a countervailing duty. And if the destination country is the United States and the Sorry, it's, it's again, it's a bit slow. I don't know why. Ah, we don't, we can't access that information. Wait, why is that? Uh, I think it's uh, again in the United States exporting country, that's why. Let's try. Yes, you are absolutely right. I can't have countervailing duties from the US to the US. So if I do that, here yeah, it's accessing the, the very large database, so that's why it takes a little bit of time. But we will see. It's taking a bit of time. We will see that there is a very long list. So, if ever you're also interested in understanding what is the effect of COVID on international trade regimes, ITC has gone through the interesting, to the, through the pain or through the process of tracking all these measures. So Azerbaijan does have one measure. The US has three measures. My own country has one measure. The country I live in, Switzerland, has one measure. These are temporary export measures. And when it comes to temporary import measures, the US has three, Azerbaijan 
has only two. Switzerland has four. So what are those? There we go. Affected products include personal equipment, personal protection equipment, pharma products, hand sanitizer, food, and certain other products. So what I'm wanting to you to, to see is how useful this market access map tool is. That's, that's basically the key point. It, it can help you see a hell of a lot of things. But particularly what's important, what's really relevant is this ability to compare tariffs applied in a target market to competitors. So understanding what is the competitiveness based on, on, on tariffs, right? So in our decision matrix, the, this is what market access conditions really refers to, okay? This is where we identify what are the different conditions in terms of competitiveness between us and other countries. Any questions? All clear, everything is clear as mud. Okay. Yes, it is. So, okay, so now you should be in the position to go back to your let me let me create the breakout rooms again. So we said we had a room for cherries. We said we had a room for apricots. And we said we had a room for hazelnuts. Rooms are now open. You are free to join your own room and start working on, on this. On the, um, on the rest of the exercise. Because now you know how you will identify the market access conditions. I will be hopping in and out of the different rooms as yesterday. I'm around. Please ask questions, ask for help if ever you need it. Okay. So I invite you to get to your, to your work rooms now. I'm, I'm here around. Yeah, sorry. I don't know how can I join to, to that group applicants from where. So I, uh, I can. Uh, yes. uh, I was I was writing to you saying that's okay. It's not a problem. Um, just make sure that uh, I'll give everyone about half an hour. So make sure that with in, in, in half an hour, say uh, it's 12, 12 noon here. So in, in half an hour, 40 minutes, come back in so you can hear the rest of the presentations. And yeah, of course, I, I completely understand that you have other things to do. That sounds like a plan. No, uh, I, uh, I just don't know how can I join that. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, um, um. Excuse me, we'll do it from the perspective. Um, 
export as an exporter from Azerbaijan? Yes. To different countries. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. It's it's the logic of understanding which are the attractive markets. What is the right market for Azerbaijani exports of cherries? You were working on cherries uh, yeah, yesterday, we, right? Yeah, we were working on cherries. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. And we have four people in apricot room and only one in cherries. <laughs> yeah, Vusal was working with somebody yesterday and uh, for some reason, Erlan, I think that Erlan was in um, hazelnuts. Oh no, there you go, oh, that's it. Was it Erlan that was working with Vusal in cherries? I don't no, know. it was Pasha. Pasha is oh, yeah, Pasha. I'm joining him right now. Um, Okay. Uh, I think Mamadiar was, in what group was Mamadiar? Uh, because he's from uh, Kobe as well. He can join our group. Okay. I don't Try know. Sure. So, Erlan, I th I seem to remember you were yesterday in the hazelnuts group, right? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, I, I have some problems with network. Yeah, no worries. Not connect to any group. Okay, I am allocating you. I'm assigning you to the hazelnuts group. Are you able to connect already, Erlan? Oh yeah, you have. Yes, he's already in that group, but uh, who is us promo? I'm not sure. Name. So we I'm have not sure. Malik in, from us promo in Apricots or Han, us promo. Maybe that was Samira from us promo. Okay, then I'll join Erlan and help him to solve this hazelnut problem. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Yeah, that was Samira. That it is indeed the, the case. Samira was yeah. working in apricots yesterday. So, Elda, do you want me to allocate you to hazelnuts? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 